deep in an underground secret Pacific Island lair, Pop Culture Minefield presents Saturday Morning Fun Time. This is the Comic Relief Crusader telling you to get your morning cereal ready because here we go! Hello, happy Saturday. It's, it's Saturday. Hope everybody's having a good Saturday. Woo! He's not here yet. He will be here. Uh, he had to drop off his brother, James. So as soon as he gets home, he will join us. Um, don't forget, after this show, I will be on Dad Man Walking stream. Um, I will be on... Oh, there! I spoke to the devil, and there's the devil. You're the devil. <laughs> oh, well. It's good to know I'm thought of very, very well. Yes. No, I yes. told you were dropping your brother James off and that you would be here as soon as you were done. So you're done. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Oh, shit. Someone's yelling. Yes, yeah, that's Mike. Tell uh, Mike to shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> you took him into submission. It's like uh, I always really said, the only people that can be friends with Scott are other loud guys. <laughs> <laughs> now remember, now remember, two guys, one brain. Two guys, one brain. <laughs> <laughs> but you look at us, all of us, you, your brothers, Scott, me, all of us friends, and we're all loud. Much to the chagrin of our significant others. Yes. So, um, I don't think Anna is bothered by it yet. <laughs> well, be. she's yet to see us in person. Be. Yeah, she's, Give it time. Yeah, when she's in the same room with us, it's going to be something else. Um but she's at work right now. She's uh, working at that uh, bistro there in, in Vienna. She's kind of liking it, kind of not liking it. Um, but uh, had an interesting situation this weekend. I'm really proud of her. But at the same time, I was like worried because she was having dinner with her family at the restaurant she works at, which is, I think, a mistake to do. To mm -hmm. where you work. And, um, and she saw that they were understaffed and they were screwing everything up. And so she got up and left her family dinner to go help them get the meals cooked and out to the tables. And I'm huh. like, oh, my God. I mean, that's so amazing. And her family was so inspired by that. Like, oh, wow, you just jumped up and took charge. But at the same time, I'm like, man, that, that would have pissed my family off if I'd done that. <laughs> but then again, I would have done it just to piss them off because I, I just I, I love my siblings, but I can't stand them. Most of them. Not all of them. You're but, so uh, full of love. But I was saying, you know, the last two times I was around James, I got quiet around him. Your brother? And I think it's because it was right after your mom's passing. But mm -hmm. So, because I was very jovial with him previously. But I got real quiet with him. And, and I don't know why. It's, it just suddenly felt like I need to be quiet and not funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and just shut the fuck up. <laughs> Well, it's 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 hard not to try to be jovial, at least for me, with with my brothers, um, because that's really how it's always been with us. You know, well, we're, you're a we're, funny we're, family. You know, um, I, I get why your family would watch the show because I think they got great senses of humor, and <laughs> I tested that humor with your brother, Kevin. Yes, I, when it when he when I first met him, and I. I said, did your brother eat some of you in the womb? Because <laughs> he's so short. No, no. You're not related to Dr. Venture by chance, are you? <laughs> yeah, you're not a creation of Dr. Venture. <laughs> yeah, the new movie is out. I haven't had a chance to watch it. been too busy. Um, and you were saying that that's, it's the end of the Venture Brothers? That's that. As far as the, the people that make it, Doc Hammer and, 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 and everyone else. I, I, again, out of all the things that you can do, that even with the strike and stuff going on, I mean, overall, it would be so easy to keep that show going. Yeah, it it just, would just It's depressing because it, that show made me happy. It, made a lot of people happy. shows that make me happy. Uh, and that they was one that in the middle of season eight. That was the thing. So yeah. the, they just ended up deciding to bring it back like five years later because they want some stuff to sell HBO Max on. So we're lucky we got anything. It could have just been the end of the last season. That's it. Well, I will say this, that when the show started, I turned 40. 
<laughs> oh my god it started the year i turned 40 and it's like man i was 50 and you know before the final season <laughs> it took forever to get that final season wow I am you're like 60 i'm a year away from six and we finally get the final movie god you're like advanced old <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm getting old, man. And that's why well, I said it's gonna be rough on me to do Dead Man Walking show this afternoon. I'm doing it after our show, and 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 I asked, I asked him how long is the stream, and then I went, oh, that is a weird question to ask a man. <laughs> how long is the stream? Uh, so well, you know, and he said, oh, sometimes we go for it, and I'm like, oh, I. I, mm, mm, mm. I said <laughs> 90 minutes sounds perfect. Two hours is too much. Uh, I, yeah. Uh, overall, I will say this: as far as the end of the Venture Brothers and what eventually, what I think initially led to that show being canceled was all of the money problems uh, that that Warner Brothers was having. Again, at the time when they had announced that that show was canceled, was almost nine months before we even found out that the amount of money that that Warner Brothers was was in the whole four was four billion more than what we originally learned. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, remember, all David Zasloff was talking about was cutting things to find three billion dollars. He was trying to find three billion dollars. Yeah, add another four billion to that. So uh, that also shows, I think, that all of the stuff that he did worked. Because the last financial call they had, they were in the black. So uh, not that much, though. But uh, it, it, it still, they still need to work to get back to where they were. But it also shows everyone that worked on that show. I mean, everyone that was working at Warner Brothers prior to Zasloff taking over were idiots who were spending money like there was no tomorrow. And again, I, I, I will say, if you if you have a company that you own and you tell a certain number of employees that you're going to fire them, but you won't do it for nine months, you just gave them nine months to screw you up. And that's basically what happened with Warner Brothers. Almost everybody that worked there that knew they were going to get fired had time to do things to to really screw Warner Brothers up. You know, Keith, I have an alternative theory. Dr. Venture reminded him too much of inheriting Warner Brothers and their financials. It's the exact same thing. You have Warner Brothers, was once glorious, now completely broke. Venture Industries, once glorious, also completely broke. And he has to sell all the shit on their previous glories. Well, yeah, there's that. There is definitely that. Although... You know, if you were giving an award for who can fall the fastest, that would definitely be Disney all day, every day, because I have never seen any company fall faster than than what Disney has done, even in the last three years. You know, between the end of, if you use the MCU as an example, as, as, as sort of like your, your watermark there, everything that has happened to the MCU between the release of the movie Endgame to now would be enough to get even Kevin Feige talked about in the conversation of people that should probably find other places to work. So, Keith, would you say kill the bee? Kill the bee. Kill the bee. Kill the bee. Now, before the show, we were talking about... um, What? Nothing. Oh, uh, we were talking about uh, Fred Freiberger, because that's really who we're going to be talking about today. Mm-hmm. And normally we try to be very proactive on this show. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about him, and we're just going to poke fun at him is really what we're going to do. <laughs> um, we're not going to be, you know, we're, and, and I referred to him, by the way, and and I disagree with you, uh, Shinotsky, uh, that prototype is the, the perfect word for him. Because the word proto means original or the rough beginnings. Uh, and so a, a, a prototypical thing, you know, which mm. is where prototype comes from, is prototypical. 
So prototype is the best word to describe him, that he is the prototype Alex Kurtzman of his time. He yes, is if, the if prototype perfect Alex failure. Kurtzman. I will agree there. Okay, <laughs> so he is the perfection of fucking things up. And, um, and, he, and when you look at his career, because he has a vast career, been working uh, since the 50s, I think. Uh, he'd worked in uh, film first. And like one of the films he worked on uh, in the script department was uh, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. I remember that one. I don't remember anything else. Mm. But he, he, you know, he'd worked on stuff. He'd worked on some really good television. But what you'll see consistently, the better the show, the less work he does. In other words, they would get one job out of him. They go, mm, and then the showrunner would go, well, we're not going to go with him again. And that's what's going on. When you see like one series and once one episode, you go, yeah, he didn't do a good job. And they probably did some massive rewrites on what he did. And you see that. But the worse the show gets, the more episodes you get. The odd one out was he wrote six episodes. I think it was six. It might have been 12. It's either six or 12. It's, everything is uh, divided by two. And... Um, for uh, Went to Dead or Alive with Steve McQueen. And I think it was six episodes. And he, um, how he lucked into that, I don't know. Uh, any of the really good shows, and if you go through his IMDb page sometime, dude, look at him, and you just see one episode, one episode, one episode, one episode, two episodes. And then you'll suddenly see 12. And of course, two shows where he was working a lot that we, Keith and I, loved to shit on him about was Space 1999, and Star Trek. And he was in what would be referred to as the fatal seasons for those shows. Um, and so did he kill Star Trek? I I think he did. I think he did because um, he was at the head of some of the worst episodes. But still, like pizza, the worst Star Trek TOC, TOS as some people like to call it, but just Star Trek. Um Still good. Yes. Fox Brain. I still enjoy it. Turnabout Intruder, as god awful as that is, I'll still watch that before I'll watch anything new. Well, that's because right. it was an established show. The show had a rhythm. The well, show the had a writer's too. room. The characters also drove those shows. Yeah. And yeah. Get and something from those characters. Yes. And so ultimately, you know, his job was to really just, you know, he seemed like the ultimate fill in guy. If you needed someone that could quickly turn around something to, to be that guy who could quickly, you know, like in comics, they would always have those guys who were able to quickly come up with stories, quick, quickly write scripts. You know, they're, they're, they're nice fill-in guys. And I think that's who Freiberger was. Well, Freiberger he, took the pl – th this is what sucks, is Gene Roddenberry abandoned Star Trek. He was upset with the onset of season three and walked out yeah and uh it, you know you just don't fucking do that you know and it's not cool what he did and it's always yeah. bothered me that he did that he abandoned yeah. it, the show that he helped create mm -hmm. you know and um and i say help because as much as he created the stories and the writing he there's two shinanskis Oh, that's a nightmare come true. What the fuck? And Michael's gone. Is this, is it, is it, which one of you is working? Uh, the, uh, okay. my internet briefly died, restarted. So, well, that must be that. what happened to Michael, too. And what happened to you, Martin, before the show? You just bloop, disappeared. Oh, my, my mic died. And so I, I had to. Do oh, okay. Because you just disappeared and we were like, where'd he go? Yeah, there's a lot of but, dying going on. But anyway, back, back to what we're talking about with, with him abandoning Star Trek Season 3. Because I believe if that season had been stronger, their numbers would have stayed up high enough to, to have saved it. Also, a lot of people don't know this, that the Nielsen ratings changed how they did their um, viewership ratings. Yeah, 1969 to, 19, yep. to 70. Uh, that's when it changed, and had they been and using they the new Star Trek, Star Trek wouldn't have been uh, canned. Yeah, it would not have been canceled. It would have lasted probably all five seasons. 
But uh, uh, again, Fred Freiberger is someone who I think was just a good person to bring in if you needed something quick to, to fill in. But at the same time, you know, he seems like one of those guys who's the quality of what he was doing wasn't that good. But if you needed someone to fill a quota. He was then, not showrunner material. Yeah. No. So and he, uh, by the way, I want to say hi to the, uh, the audience here. Uh, I saw some people just popped in. So all hail Lord Thoth. Thoth is here. Slasher Fred is here. Uh, Bush McFadden is here. Bush. What is up, buddy? Uh, Penny, of course, is here. Hi, Penny. And let's see. Um, I saw Anima. Anima is here. She's still at work, but she is Anima. Here. So, by the way, uh, when I'm doing voice to text, uh, I say her name and it just spells it out as Anime. <laughs> anime <laughs> confuse you. Oh, just a red shirt is here, too. Just another red shirt. Be hey, hey. You, my friend. Oh, another you're, fellow uh, you're, fan of the prisoner. Thank your God, phone uh, makes you feel the way you make me feel. That is good to know. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, going to be a new Star Trek series called Phase Two. What? Uh, hold up, hold up. Would Alex Kurtzman be stupid enough to try to do? Uh, actually, wait a minute. Let me back up. He thinks he's good enough to be Gene Roddenberry. He has oh, jeez. Oh, remember, Keith, remember my words of wisdom. Never underestimate stupidity. Mm -hmm. When you think oh, someone yeah. can't possibly be that stupid, that is exactly when they will be. Yep. You're, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Kurtzman just thinks so highly of himself. Look, it's taken me a while to get there, but I am now soured on everyone that has ever worked with, worked for, and is an acolyte of J.J. Abrams. None of yes, you all amen. have any talent. And that's that's the big fear because now there's been this backlash against From, the series. And uh, I'm wondering if it's about some of the stuff that I talked about, where it went kind of woke at the beginning mm -hmm. and the, the girlfriend character was really weird and doesn't fit into the stories. In fact, if you skip every scene she's in, it's still a, you know, a show. You don't, you don't gain anything or lose anything from her being on the show, and that says something. That when a character doesn't have an impact on the series, they don't belong there. So why was she put in there? Um, so I just, um, I don't know. I think they they messed up in season two, but from everything I've read, they did get greenlit for a season three. So I hope they, I hope they fix it, but. Again, these are all J.J. Abrams acolytes working on that show. Yeah. So I, I just anticipate they'll do something stupid. You know, because they don't plan shit out. The important thing is to have mysteries and then figure them out later because yeah. the hook is what matters. The great way to write a mystery, as I was always told, is write the beginning, write your conclusion, and then start working it out. Yeah. In the middle. And... You have to have your planned conclusion. You have to have it. To have a good mystery, you have to already know where it's going. Mm -hmm. Agatha or, Christie, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Or there's what Agatha Christie would do is she would write it out, get to her end, and then she'd go back and make sure it made fucking Everything sense. matched up, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a still the same principle. As, yeah. You know, because... Your beginning and end to a story is absolutely where everything is important. You mm -hmm. have to have a good start and you have to have a good conclusion. The in-between stuff is important, but only to get you to the, that great beginning to the great ending. And, uh, and, and a, you know, a good story is only as good as its ending. And, oh, and, uh, that's and true. one thing I've noticed with detective fiction, which, you know, there's always this talk about, oh, better hide exposition. I've realized something very important. Uh, end of a lot of great detective stories is literally just the main character expositing everything that just fucking happened, lean to the conclusion. You know what? What you have there is the makings of a really good sequel or spinoff to um, a really, really, really classic movie because th that, that right there could be the middle of a massive diatribe to a sequel or spinoff to Murder by Death. Yeah, I've always wanted to see a sequel to that. I mean, we kind of got a, a the side quote to it, which yeah, was which was Clue. The Chief Detective. Which oh, had, Chief Detective. Yes, 
It had the same two actors, Eileen Brennan and um, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Columbo, um, Peter Falk. Peter Falk. But this time he's playing another character, but mm -hmm. it's clearly the same character. It's clearly the same written character. by the same screenwriter, Paul Simon, or not Paul Simon, uh, Paul. Oh, the guy that wrote The Odd Couple. Neil Simon. Neil Simon, thank you. Um, I think I think I, 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 I saw I, people upset over Paramount dropping Prodigy. Um, here, let me be sad about that. Hold on. Yeah, yeah I know. I don't. I don't give <laughs> I'm trying. Uh, I, I'm saw so premise, I saw the premise, and I went, "That's not Star Trek. It's not Star Trek." They slapped the name on there, but it has nothing to do with Star Trek. I'll tell. I'll tell yeah. you what I've told other people. Look at the episode. Yeah. The people behind Prodigy. Look at the episodes of Rick and Morty that they actually did work on, and and ask yourself one thing: Why were they released from that show? Because they weren't that good. If they were any good, they'd still be working on Rick and Morty. So you know that, that was never a reason to hire any of those cats. And and guess what? It's the same group of idiots who are also ruining the MCU. Are you talking about Lower Decks? Oh, Lower Decks, same thing. Prodigy, it's all the same thing to me. It's crap. Yeah. It's all just crap. It's You're no going to make a, a Star Trek show for kids. As R&B likes to say, Star Trek was always for kids. You didn't have to make a special series to do that because it was really aimed at the entire family. Yeah. I mean, growing up, my sister was all about Riker and Troy. Mm -hmm. Before that, you could watch, you know, you weren't going to see McCoy and, and Scotty and, and Kirk and Spock start dropping F-bombs the way they do on Strange New Weird. So, you know, that show is increasingly becoming a very, very, very racially and culturally in, uh, insensitive show. So, I, I, I completely agree that, it, I mean, the entire basis of all the JJ stuff is basically stereotypes at this point. It is. All of it's stereotypes. That's, that's really what everybody does. And again, I'm going to say it, and I know people hate it, but it's like Dumb 7, which you guys know is the movie The Batman. It's Dumb 7. It's 7 <laughs> for dumb people. <laughs> the two main detectives in there don't do any detective work. <laughs> and they don't talk or share notes until um, we're almost two hours into it. Yeah, and, I, I love and then how they fuck up and they don't even recognize simple Spanish. I, he has a freaking back computer. Barry, just pull out your fucking cell phone. What is this in Spanish? What is this Spanish to English? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I mean, it's, it, it, it's penguin. It's Batman. I, I it's will Batman. say this. I will say this also. Um, and, and I know this is taking us away from Fred Freiberger, but this is actually part of the whole, whole same thing. There's a new documentary on Max about DC Comics. It just got loaded on there. Let me save everybody some time. Uh, on the one hand, there are things in that documentary that have never really been talked about a lot that I enjoy. Even, even a person with my knowledge will say, well, that's, that's good to have that in there. But in reality, you can tell from the people that they've highlighted in there and the interviews that they have, this is all predicated on all of the um, post, or I should say, this was a documentary that was definitely created and who, whom they did a majority of the work while Walter Hamada was still there. So while you've got Patty Jenkins, who comments a lot on stuff, you've got Robert Pattinson and, 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 and Zoe, who both comment a lot. You know, uh, you even have part of it, you know, you do some interviews with Gal Gadot, uh, and you even have Henry Cavill. But so far, no Ben Affleck at all. 
I have zero interest in. It. I saw it pop up on the feed to, to watch. Yeah, I looked at it. My problem is modern documentaries uh, are done with an eye that really annoys me, and well, uh, by focusing on on wrong things, yes, and giving wrong information too. Like I just started to watch the the new Oppenheimer documentary that came out in tandem with the movie. Okay, mm -hmm. I was watching it until Bill Nye pops on. And I just immediately turned it off. I'm like, you're a fucking engineer. You're not a fucking real scientist. Fuck off. Mm -hmm. Why is he speaking about anything dealing with uh, Oppenheimer? Yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, to me, I look at it as purely entertainment when he pops on. But, I, I mean, after everything that's happened, especially with uh, 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 Wonder Woman 84, uh, the, the reason why I decided to uh, give that documentary a, a, a look was because Leslie Iwerks was behind it. And she is a very, very, very good documentary filmmaker. And when I say very good, I mean Academy Award winning documentary filmmaker. And I like her work. You know, the documentary she made about uh, Pixar is still to me one of the best documentaries about any entertainment company ever. And then the one she did about her grandfather, who in it's pretty clear that Disney as a, as a company would not exist without him. Uh, well, I will say this. Saying Oscar winning doesn't mean shit to me anymore. Um, oh, good point. Good point. But back when the Academy Awards actually meant something. Uh, <laughs> that's been a while, dude. Over 20 True. years. True. You know, but, True. But here's what I, I do have to say is I like her, her work, too. Yeah, my she did with, this. With, my thing with documentarians is they should not be putting themselves into this. This is why documentarians hate Michael Moore. Yeah. He calls himself a documentarian, and he's not. He gives you a skewed opinion. And if your mm -hmm. opinion is in there, if anything that you think or feel is in that film, it's not a documentary. And his are always politically skewed. So therefore, he's not a documentarian, and he needs to stop calling himself that. Mm -hmm. And he, he won an Oscar. And yes. uh, maybe even a couple. I don't know. Um, he's a dick. I can't stand the guy. But um, he's a terrible filmmaker, too, because his films are full of lies. And, and this is the problem we have today, though, is we've got these things calling themselves documentaries. But are they really? Are they really? If there's opinion in there, it's not a documentary. Mm -hmm. And a documentary needs to document what's happening or what happened without any opinion involved with it it leaves the audience to decide how they feel mm -hmm. and well, so i just i'm nervous about any new documentary and i saw that drop this week and my reaction was i'm probably not going to watch that well it's 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 really a peek inside of of what i like to call and sarnoff's dc mm. that's really the version of dc that they're celebrating in terms so, of talking about the comic book talent. That makes me wonder what would be better, uh, taking a peek into her rectal exam or a documentary <laughs> about the future in D.C. And I suspect the rectal exam probably more entertaining. <laughs> well, more educational, too. More educational. Uh, again, some of these people are no longer hey, with the company. Hey, there's a polyp. She has a polyp. <laughs> some of these people are no longer working in tandem like that. And, and also... Uh, uh, Anne Sarnoff herself is no longer there. And then they you could tell that they inserted some newer interviews. Uh, so they have uh, commentary. Also, uh, a few words from uh, James Gunn sprinkled in there and a few other people. But for the most part, it's all uh, everybody that was all good with uh, Anne Sarnoff before she got fired. So it's Jeff Johns. It's uh oh, and Greg Berlanti's also along with uh um. Oh my along... god! Fuck that guy. If he's in that documentary, I'm not watching. Oh, he's not only in it; he's one of the producers. I'll along never watch with Leslie it. I'll never Irons. watch it. I'll never watch it. Vakeman's girl. The answer is no. That is um, what's his name? Uh, Morgan Spurlock. You're thinking of, and he's a dickhead too. Um, oh yeah, the documentary was. By the way, I'm an alcoholic. I'm not going to bring up that fact. Why is my liver being damaged? <laughs> He's a the whole super size me is such a bullshit film because within the film, the guy one guy answers it, 
yeah, I eat McDonald's every day, and he's very healthy because he, he doesn't eat the fries. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and he doesn't get the big, giant, supersized stuff. But mm -hmm. what Gordon wanted to do is, like, supersize everything, upsize everything. And, of course, you're going to fucking die if you eat that every day, dumb fuck. <laughs> God damn, he's such an asshole. Arrogant. Arrogant asshole. Uh, but anyway. Uh, I mean, he did supersize me, too, and that didn't do well. Yeah, anymore. it didn't do any well, because people were onto his fucking game. You know, it's oh. like. You got to be really it, stupid to fall for that shit. Oh, we, it's even more funny people. though. It's even more funny because one of the people he emphasizes as being a great human being is Jared from fucking Subway. <laughs> That's funny. I'm sorry, Jared. Break you. God did that age well. Um, but again, all I said, all, everything I said to go back and attach it to this. You know, this mentality that some people have where it is, you can definitely tell that uh, they have no real interest in what they are producing. You know, they, they have no feel for it. They have no background, no, no real knowledge that is helpful as an entertainer to add anything to what they're doing. They're just filling space, you know, they're moving air you know, uh, air from their, their mouths and they're saying words that mean nothing. And that's what we have. In fact, we have a lot more Fred Freiburgers in the entertainment industry at this point in time right now than we've ever had. Yeah. And, and again, it doesn't have to be, you know, about geek and nerd type stuff. It can be anything. Well, uh, can I add to that, though? Yeah, go ahead. I think part of it is the, the narcissism aspect of it. The mm -hmm. people are narcissists. That their focus is not on Star Trek, telling good stories. Their interest is in getting their name on the beginning of the show. That's a real drive. And it bugs me that so many names are at the beginning of the show. The, the t opening titles for Star Trek Strange New Worlds first season was 35, 40, 40 seconds of cast and a minute of every fucking producer and Kurtzman has to put created by Alex Kurtzman which is a lie it's not just it's not like shining it a little bit oh you're shining a little bit no Pike was created by Gene Roddenberry mm -hmm. created by Gene Roddenberry every major character in that show except for the the fake ones that are weird like the instant, ship. In, instant dyke uh, fucking annoys me uh, with her raked hair. Fuck her. Her and her having to turn around to talk to people from the helm. I got to tell you, man, um, Pike is a shitty captain on that show. Yeah. Well, that person turn around and talk to him or even talk to him the way she talks to him. It's it's uh, not. It, you know, it's, 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 what are you doing? Who do you think you're talking to? It's it's a it's a Vegas version of Star Trek. You know, I mean that that entire world that Kurtzman has put together is not Star Trek. It's a Vegas version, a phony version of it. That's in Ortega. Yeah, it's, it's, she's fucking terrible. I think she's Ortega. I think Ortega is also based on one of the names used either in the comics or one of the other episodes. But I mean, there's a lot of references to Star Trek. Uh, Kyle. Who is your um, who handles the transporter is also another one of the names of, of characters introduced in Star Trek, uh, and that particular character made it into all the all into some of the movies. Yeah. I know he made it into Star Trek too. I, I can and go into it, why I, it is. Say that because, because, uh, sorry. I can go into why these people do it because they're not creative. But they want the accolades and glory. So the only thing well, that that's they the can narcissism do, aspect. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, the only thing they can do is attach themselves to something else and then try putting create by as many times as possible and hoping people forget that Gene Roddenberry ever existed. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's the same thing Kennedy does with Lucas. It's yep. it's, it's absolutely true. Um, narcissism. It's Buffalo Bill. They're Buffalo Bill. They want to skin Star Trek and wear a Star Trek suit. Yeah. Oh, you mean um, that Buffalo Bill? Got you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
It puts the lotion in the basket. It puts the Star Trek on. It puts the lotion on the Star the Trek, or it the gets the, or it gets the Kelvin universe again. Oh, oh my geez. god! Oh my god! It's just so awful. But before Alex Kurtzman and J.J. Abrams and Akiva Goldsman, who got an Oscar undeservedly, um, I mean, when he got his Oscar, I, I just like what the fuck. Anyway. Um, You've got these people who are undeserving of these roles in Star Trek, and they absolutely are. And um, it, it kills me. It pains me when I see somebody go, well, I kind of like it. And I'm like, I, and I, I have to just tune people out. I just did it this week um, with something else completely different. I'll, I'll bring it up here because it's personal. Oh. Blade Runner. Oh, you know, yeah. You know my background with Blade Runner. Right? Oh, yeah. So, you know, I'm not just a fan. I'm the founder of the fan club. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm the guy who built the community along with my buddy Gary later. He joined me a, a year later after I started it. And we built that community and we kept Blade Runner alive. And it is because of our hard work that we got the final cut of Blade Runner. And we know we, we've been given thanks for what we did. And you get these fucking people, I swear to God. So I, I got in there and, you know, Rick is a good friend of mine and he's been on the show. I love Rick and uh, Mike, uh, Arthur. These are guys that are in the Blade Runner community. They build their Facebook communities and they're really big and they're doing great. And I'm, I'm proud of them. And I'm glad to be friends with these guys. But Rick Howard and, and Mike started a discussion about Rick Deckard. And if you if you say the glowing eyes make Rick Deckard and Holden um, replicants, then J.F. Sebastian is a replicant, too, because when yep. they come out of the elevator, his eyes glow. Yep. And um, so I just said it was one of the hokiest fucking gimmicks in the film. It was kind of nifty, but build a whole idea and plot off of that is weird. But that's and that's the essence you of do it Alex Kurtzman. You set things up through the writing. And it's yep. just not there because as... Um, uh, Fancher said, and uh, uh, people said, "It's we never wrote that in the script. That's what we really started doing on the set. And what's the rule of filmmaking? If it's not in the script, it's not in the film. Mm -hmm. And so there's all kinds of problems with the, you know, Deckard being a replicant. And, um, you know, and it relies on so much. But here's what I said in that group when that was posted. I said, I, I've, um, I've never seen anybody talk about it until after the director's cut him being a replicant. It was just never a subject that was brought up. And mm -hmm. then somebody said, well, I read in, in um, one of the magazines, and I'm like, that never happened. I read all those magazines, you know, Starburst, um, Fantastic Films, Starlog, Fangoria, every single bit, Cine Fantastique. Um, I read forget every all. magazine that had an article on Blade Runner, and that was never brought up in the 80s. I said, we did, it did not become part of the lexicon until after the director's cut came out with the unicorn dream being put mm -hmm. back in. And then it became a subject of discussion. This guy today came on and says, that's a lie, telling me I'm full of shit. Um, says, I remember with my memories, my dad and me talking and about it. And I'm like, first of all, you're probably a replicant and those, implant, those are implants. I'm just being a dick. I mean, you, clearly, you're, you're not a real person. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, you're trying to make an argument with your memories versus, you know, empirical proof. I have empirical proof. There's nothing in any magazine discussing that. Not once during the 80s. None of them. And wow. I said, I've gone through them. I went and I downloaded every single one that covered Blade Runner and the issues that they covered. And I went through my proof to Nothing, nothing about it. So fuck these guys. And another guy jumped in today. And I, what I do is I end up blocking these people because I don't really feel like talking and interacting with stupid people. And But in my argument, I didn't say that people didn't come to that conclusion. What I said is it was not a topic of discussion. If it were, it would have been put in the sci-fi periodicals at the time. Okay. Well, yeah. It's going to be a point of contention long after we're all dead and the movie is actually... It's not a point of contention for me because I know what the facts are. Mm -hmm. I know. But I'm saying it's good for the legacy of the movie because it's going to be one well, of the Well, it's always that. interesting to see the debate and I just sort of laugh it off and just walk away. 
you know, it's like, whatever, <laughs> you know, yeah. if that's what freaks your doogie, that's what freaks your doogie. Okay. Uh, Deckard has to be a replica, even though it doesn't make any sense in the story. And it's Go still, it's still down the middle. So, and it's going to stay down the middle. It's, I think it's pretty much right down the middle. It is. It's 50, 50, but, um, all of that didn't happen until after 1992 when they released the director's cut. At that point, nobody was talking about it. Here's a fun question then. Is Tyrell a replicant because they were originally planning on the one that he killed that being was, a replicant? That was something we also found out after 92. Because um, that wasn't something we were aware of until the 90s. That yeah. there was a scene originally meant to be shot. We knew about Mary. That scene was well known within the community. We knew about that scene, but there was references to Rutger or Roy Batty going into a tomb, but it didn't say, um, it didn't explain what was going on with Tyrell. So it wasn't, a, it was disassociated with the film. It's like, well, what was that about? Then in the 90s, we find out, oh, that was a continuation after he kills um, Tyrell. And springs and shit come out of his head. And that they were going to, he was going to go into another room, an antechamber, where he's in a tomb. And it was like, oh, holy shit. That would have changed everything. Now that would have made the film question. It would have it created an actual physical manifestation of what Ridley wanted to do if they'd kept that in. Without that, there's nothing. Yeah. Yep. And no one's debating about Tyrell being a replicant or not, even though that was actually something they originally intended. So, hey, Salty Nerd Podcast is here. What is up, guys? Hey, hey. you guys are the best, man. We love you guys. Yeah, um, I, I, I fall on the human debate. I just find the logic people use to this to be in endlessly fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the way, Salty Nerds gives us a nine ninety nine super sticker. It says, uh, or super chat it says, "Good to see everyone. Have a great live stream. Thanks a lot, buddy. Appreciate it, man. I don't know if, uh, if this is Matt or Matt or um, I'm not sure. Alex, is it you? I don't know. Um, but whoever it is, thank you, man. We love all you guys. Um, appreciate it. Let's get you a video. I got a new video, so I will uh, play you the brand new video. Actually, I'll play you two. There we go. I love it when a plan comes together. There we go. <laughs> Nobody. By the way, by the way, there is one advantage Freiburg has over Kurtzman. Very simply, Freiburg's dead. He can't do any more damage. Well, I got to tell you, Freiburger could actually write. You know, I, I don't want to like say he was a great writer. He's not. He was an okay writer. Uh, he was one of those guys that does the first pass and needs to be handed over to another writer to fix what he wrote, um, which is what screwed everything up for Space 1999 in Star Trek, in that he was head writer now. He was showrunner. And uh, when <sighs> there was a big shakeup with Space 1999, uh, Keith, I mean, you, you can talk about this just as much as I can. Well, that uh, well, it, was well, IT, it was ITC's American division that fucked everything up. Yes, because they were trying to expand into uh, they wanted more of an American audience. You got to remember, they wanted to turn it more into a Monster of the Week Star Trek kind of show. That's and, right. And somebody says, "Well, who is uh, the, the showrunner? Gene Roddenberry and Fred Freiberger." Well, we can't get Gene Roddenberry. How about we go for Fred Freiberger? I guarantee mm -hmm. you that's how that conversation went down. More than likely. You know. More than likely. You know, and didn't look at the fact that Gene, when he was showrunner, ran a tight ship, made a good show. Third season comes along, Fred Freiberger, and things get a little loosey goosey, and that's so good. Um, oh, man, and, and so he know, comes in and starts writing these shows. And I'm going to tell you something. You know what he was good at writing? Kids what? shows, yeah, and cartoons because that was something he did. And he was good at writing kids shows. And because he's got a very simplistic way of writing, and that works. Like he worked on a few episodes of Run Joe Run. You remember that show, right? Uh, not at the top of my the, head. The, the German Shepherd. That it's the fugitive, but with a dog. Oh yeah, <laughs> Joe show? Run Joe. I fucking love Run Joe Run, and uh, he was. Um, 
uh, what was it? Um, like the A team uh, accused military dog or police dog yeah. accused of a crime, uh, <laughs> and has to amazing. stay on the run at, from family to family. And man, I lo- his writing on that worked because he wrote from a very Saturday morning perspective. But I bet you he would have screwed up even Star Trek for the animated series because I that, love- it's a little sal- it's more sal- cerebral than he's capable of. What's that? I love that show so much that my first dog was called Joe. <laughs> I get that. that joke. Oh, I I became a fan of German Shepherds because of that show. And little did I know that German Shepherds is one of the most bitey dogs out there. They were designed for it. They were genetically designed to bite. So it's like, oh, they bite a lot? How odd. <laughs> <laughs> you know the real shame with him? He had one of the best names to like start a burger joint with. Fred's Fried, Fried Burger. Burgers. <laughs> That's hey, come to Fry Burgers, burger. where you can get a nice you know, order of fries with your burger. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, um, but anyway, Fry Burger, uh, you know, did some good work. Don't get me wrong. But the more simplistic and childish the show to even lower budget stuff, the better he did. And you, if you go to IMDb, you'll notice that with his writing that, there would be just like shows, a series where there's only one episode, one episode, one episode, one episode, one episode. And these are episodic television where they use writers, a tendency of using them over and over again. Why was he only getting those one gigs? You know, and the reason why it's it's sort of like a, a guy that Keith and I know here in town, why he doesn't get hired uh, a second time by a production company. And he's a special effects guy and he does one film for a production company and they'll never hire him again because he screws things up and he's the thief. And um, so uh, here in town, a lot of us don't want to work with him. And it's why I quit working a lot with a lot of local film people because they want to work with him. I'm like, I'm not going to work with this guy. I won't say his name, but um, he just, uh, you know, you set a, a, a precedence for yourself. And so, it ended up, uh, this is the sort of thing I think was happening to Freiberger, where he was um, doing the work and wasn't turning it out to where they felt like we can shoot with this. So they would have to have somebody probably rework everything he wrote. And that's why you see one episode, one episode, one episode, on and on and on till the end of his career. Uh, the only two, three big gigs he's got is Wanted Dead or Alive, which I don't know how he, and I'm going to guess that he was probably one of the one of the writers per episode, not a, the writer. Uh, because, oh, um, those shows are good if you've never seen them, one of dead or alive. And I don't believe for a second he was the lead writer on those. Uh, Star Trek, you can see where his hand is in the work. And same thing with Space 1999. Everything is simple, monster of the week kind of stuff. And the characters are not nearly as interesting or deep as they were in the first season of Space 1999. And it led to tension on the set between uh, Barbara Bain and uh, Martin Landau and Fred Freiberger. And they were constantly complaining about the scripts. It's like, this is stupid. I don't want to do this. Is this, is he really to, uh, was it? Uh, was it Jason Friedberg, the guy that did all those terrible parody movies? Like uh, over a decade ago, I I don't know. Um, I can look it up real quick. Um, I it doesn't. I'm looking at it's, it right now. It, it it's just an interesting life. coincidence. No otherwise, uh, what what did he do? Uh, you know, like Meet the Spartans, the X movie, oh, Noun movie. Period. Oh, that's no. His name is Freeberg, not Freeberger. Oh, okay. Yeah. But he worked on um, 16 episodes. He was really good with tele- you know, cartoons. He worked on a lot of cartoons and had repetitive work on those because he writes at that level. He wrote for Super Friends. He wrote for the emergency uh, TV series, the animated one. Uh, he worked on ABC Saturday uh, Superstar movies. Um, he worked on the new Scooby-Doo movies. He worked on C-Lab 2020 you know, let me go through the list of cartoons. He, he, he Josie and the Pussycats. Uh, now, that he didn't do very many episodes of those. He did one episode of Emergency. Um, and again, I, I'm going to guess that the writer's room, because the showrunner was really good on that. 
So I'm, I'm kind sure. of impressed, Gary. You've managed to make the statement writing on the sixth grade reading level into a positive. Uh, no, it's more like a fourth grade. It's fourth grade. Because uh, yeah. most television, if, if you didn't know this, was written at a fourth grade level. All the way from when it started. It was always written in a very simple way. And the simpler something is, the better Freeburger does. Um, could we have been the one Nichelle Nichols wrote about in her book that she told Uhura doesn't do that to? Probably. Uh, in fact, I would say yes. Because uh, she was had a little more authority by the third season. Because uh, like the first two seasons, she was a day player. A lot of people don't know that. And during the second season, she got really popular. And um, uh, so by the third season, she was, uh, uh, you know, really part of the cast. And she was in uh, more of the episodes third season. So, yeah, she would understand her better and probably told him that. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, look, emergency is why I ended up working in the medical field. That show inspired me to want to be a medic and help people. Uh, yeah, I get you, Lord Thoth, on that one. Uh, and don't complain that you can't find the meat. What is that? I'm the, I think it's about the hypothetical burger. Oh, the burger. <laughs> Where's Fred's the meat? <laughs> fried burgers. <laughs> and Fred's fried burgers. Well, for a fast food change, I would, uh, like I said, I would actually go fries and burger. Fry burgers. Yeah, fries, fries and burgers. burgers. Yeah, Fred's yeah. fries and burgers. There you go. Uh, Mercy was awesome show and a favorite since I was a kid. Yeah, um, I mean it really changed. It was I cosplayed for Halloween once as one of the paramedics uh, when I was a kid. I think it was eleven when I did it. I put the emergency um, thing on my let's see. jacket. One I did see when I was a kid, I slightly remember, uh, Superboy. He actually wrote like six episodes of that. Well, that was once again not a, a very kid well written show. It's a kid show. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think you can write a kid show and still make it good. Hit Star Trek. Star Trek is for the whole family, it's for kids too. And, um, you know, it's very much at a G to PG level, you know, show. But, uh, uh, emergency, yeah, I love SWAT too. Great themes for both shows. Um, wow, what SWAT? Yeah, yeah, SWAT. What a great theme! Quincy Jones mm -hmm. wrote that theme. I don't know he, who wrote the theme to to Emergency, but I also like that theme. Uh, he, and that was all Jack Webb stuff. There, he did um, uh, uh, what do you call? It? He did uh, Dragnet. He did Adam Twelve. He did Emergency. And what's neat about Emergency, a lot of people don't know this, is that the first episode of Emergency ties in directly with his, his historical fact that mm -hmm. the paramedic program got started in Los Angeles. And what the paramedic program was a test to see if a well-trained medic, uh, you know, higher level trained medic, could work when in communication directly with a physician in the emergency room, could do life-saving measures that other EMTs weren't able to do at the time. And it changed paramedicine forever, the first test in Los Angeles. And, uh, and that's what that show was created for, was to help push, you know, uh, this across the country, to get more mm -hmm. paramedics across the country. And it was it, that was the intention by um, Jack Webb and his co-creator on that was yep. to help spread the word of what paramedics could do that could yep. save your damn life. Um, you became a first responder too, yeah. You get it. Doing shows uh, you like that I do, dang the shows you like that I do. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Um, but uh, yeah, because these are shows I've wanted to talk about on here. You know, I wanted to go into shows like Emergency, Dragnet, Adam 12. Adam 12 was also made with intent because Los Angeles was trying to clean up the police department because they'd had a problem with corruption all the way up into the 50s, going into the early 60s. They were cleaning up. And so there was discussions between Jack Webb and the police department. 
at, for him to create a show. And they already love Dragnet. And in fact, if you watch Dragnet, you'll see Officer Reed, his first appearance was on Dragnet before Adam 12. And, uh, and there was talk about, uh, you know, because every episode of Dragnet in the 60s on had the um, year that it takes place. So it was Dragnet 67, Dragnet 68, Dragnet 67, Dragnet 70. And then the show ended. And then uh, Jack Webb wanted to bring it back. And um, the next show was going to be Dragnet 82, one of my favorite years. And he was going to have uh, Officer Reed be a detective now. And he was going to be his new partner because Harry Morgan was busy with MASH. So he, he couldn't do it. So uh, he talked to that actor, was going to do it. Everything was happy. It was greenlit, got its budget, got its money. And he has a fucking massive heart attack and dies in his house. And that's why we never got a follow-up to Dragnet until 2004, I think. 2001, 2004, right in that window. Yeah. And you had uh, Al Bundy play Friday. Do you ever see that? Anybody? No. Yeah. No. It was a good show. It was really good. Uh, my buddy Jeremy uh, uh, was in, I think, the uh, last episode of the, of the first season. And uh, he was the, one of the villains in it. Jeremy Roberts. But anyway, I like the show. I have all the episodes on my computer, so I can just pop it in whenever I feel like it. One Adam 12, one Adam 12. See the man. Oh, Keith's fall asleep. <laughs> yep. It's uh, another thing he produced, I found out, Beyond Westworld. Yeah, that was not a very good show. Yeah. <laughs> um, Got two episodes aired, so yeah. Yeah, he, he, he got canceled track he record. really had a chance. Um, yeah, and what you're saying there, Lord Thoth, I did, it's how I was. Uh, as a kid, I, I lived in a community where um, there were a lot of old people. And I was just, you know, they, they always called me just this nice kid. They all knew, oh, he was a nice boy. Because I would just do favors for everybody and go do things for the elderly. And I loved helping them. And ironically, uh, one of those old ladies, she hit me with a cane the first time I met her. <laughs> she threw her cane at me. Because I, went, I, I was a newspaper boy. I had the largest newspaper route in Fredericksburg. And uh, it was like a small city where we lived. And I was their newspaper boy. And I went to collect my first, you know, the first month I was there, I went to collect from her for her paper. And when she heard me speak, she said some cuss words at me. Yankee was one of the words. And hit me with a cane, threw it at me. You send somebody else, boy. I went, oh, okay. She ended up being nice to me. And then years later, I, I was a nurse. And she ended up in a nursing home I worked at. And I took care of her. You know, and she was a sweet old lady. I liked her, despite throwing a cane at me. She just got used to me. She didn't like me because I was a Yankee when she first met me. I once said that Trek can't be created for an audience because it attacks its own. I don't think people understand what, what I'm saying. Uh, yep, Nova Scotia boy. The whole place is a retirement community. Um, my favorite, though, Slasher Fred, was uh, one Adam 12, one Adam 12, see the man. <laughs> it was used so often on the show. And another great thing about that, that's a real police dispatcher they hired. She, so that's why she sounds so authentic. Uh, it's sort of like when they hired Dale Dye for video games and movies. Where he he's actually also he uh, Arlie Ermy was used for a lot of the radio chatter you hear in Apocalypse now, but you'll see a lot of military movies where you'll hear chatter. It's actually just Dale Diary Arlie Ermy. They hire him because they sound genuine when they do radio, uh, radio transmission. Oh, and that you were going to say you got your revenge, PD. No, no, I took care of her. I really cared for her. And when she passed away, uh, her family gave me her crucifix. And I asked if it was okay because I'm a nurse. I didn't know if we could receive gifts. And uh, my girlfriend was the administrator. And she goes, yeah, there's no trouble with that. If they want to leave that to you. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I got it. And that's, of course, my ex-girlfriend, ex Patty, who I'm still close friends with. She's amazing. Oh, and that you were going, yeah, 
yeah. No, no revenge. No revenge. The only revenge I had is I outlived her. <laughs> yep. But uh, getting back to it. Um, Let's see. For, um, Wild Wild West. He did Wild Wild West. Whoa. Yeah, he worked on that. But again, that was a writing team. The showrunner who was in charge of that show uh, had a writing team. And he only worked for the first season. He got fired after the first season. I remember that. And uh, so he worked on the first season. And it's also the weakest season of the show. They didn't really come into their own until season two. Yeah, it's like anybody that puts down, you know, a show like Roseanne during its first season or Next Gen during the first two seasons. You know, there's a good chance that you probably didn't work any other seasons beyond that. So, yeah, because it, it, it had trouble. If they have trouble, uh, what they're looking for is the best fit writers, the writers that fit. And um, if he leaves after the first season, that's a clear sign he didn't fit. It didn't work. And when you go and read, a lot of people don't know how to read um, IMDb. When you start seeing a trend of only work here, periodic work, sporadic work, it's usually a sign of something. And uh, and it's a good way of, it's sort of looking at, at the resume and you can tell a lot from it because that's all IMDb is every actor, movie, employee resume and it says what they worked on and uh, how long they worked on it. And you can look at his resume and see that he had some problems. And the only places where he had steady work uh, usually lasted for the one season or drove the show into the ground until it ca got canceled. Because he just, like as a showrunner, he's terrible. Just terrible. And um, and like I said, he's the, the, the prototypical um, Alex Kurtzman for Alex Kurtzman was apparently even a glint in his mother's eye. Because I don't think he's old enough to have been around during that period. I think he was born in the seventies, wasn't he? Alex Kurtzman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's, he's young yeah. and, 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 and still an idiot. Uh, <laughs> I just, again, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that you have a lot of these people that have been corrupted by JJ Abrams and the way that he works. And, and it just seems like it's more important to uh, get paid or to yeah, because you and I have talked about that too, Keith. That they think success is spelled by them getting a paycheck. Yeah, yeah. The all, I mean, while they're all the paycheck. deals that JJ made, whether you're talking the deals that he made for for Star Trek or with Star Wars, uh, uh, all of the stuff that you see with uh, the Batman. All look that entire thing with that movie is structured like the same kind of deal. That 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 JJ usually gets, you know, the ability to be able to change characters, have them look radically radically different, have them act radically different, just so that you can create a version of the character that you can then easily uh, make money from whenever you make toys or other things based on the likeness of the character from whatever you're making, and that really is it. You know, it's it's a money thing in the end and none of these people have a true love of it you know even even if jj says that you know he's supposed to be this big star wars fan he still pulled the same maneuver on the force awakens why does c-3po need a red arm that was specifically so he could make money from selling the c-3po figures with the red leg yeah with the red with the red arm is it arm or leg Arm. It was arm. That's right. He's just greedy. He's the cancer. Attach myself to an IP and then jettison everything the Locust. IP replace with yep. my five percent different version of something. Yeah. Well, so I get paid. But they're all greedy. I mean, again, what do you? What did you think that entire movie of the Batman was? You just had a Batman on screen, and you have to radically change everything to the point where you know. You, Look, th that does not stop uh, uh, from finding all of that merchandise on the clearance aisles. You know, you could almost stock an entire store with all of the 
related merchandise of J.J. Abrams or anybody associated with J.J. Abrams, uh, 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 with the exception of Alex Kurtzman, because his stuff is never good enough to make any merchandise from. So, <laughs> well, the first mistake made with that was the Joker worked because you had a, a, an effective writer director who borrowed from two films, mm-hmm. Taxi Driver and King uh, uh, King of Comedy. Yes, <clears throat> two great um, films by um, Martin Scorsese. Okay, so he borrows from them heavily. But he tells an effective story in a way that it works. It works. And uh, it deals with mental illness, that the main character is an unreliable narrator. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, and it works. Then you get another director says, I'm going to do the same thing. And he borrows from Seven. And what was the other film he borrowed from? I forgot now. King of Comedy. No, for the Batman. Oh, for the Seven. Batman? Uh, it was seven, and seven's the big one because yeah. the majority of what they use in that film is nothing but seven, just just told badly. Just seven, and it's told in a bad way, and you have two detectives in it, not detecting anything, and not communicating because they're supposed to be friends. We don't see them talk until going into the third act, and unintentional comedy in it, you know. That scene in the jail when they don't even take his mask off. Batman's in the jail, okay, unconscious. And um, he gets up and and talks to the commissioner, Gordon. He sees that dude from the club, right, Penguin's Club. And he says, who's the guy with the mustache and the broken nose? And then he punches Gordon right in the fucking nose. (laughs) That is get Get it? The... The, 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 if you here's my impersonation of, of every fan of that movie trying to explain away all the mistakes. Well, it's his second year. He's only been Batman, you know, for for two years. That, that's it. Everybody that's knows your explanation for years. every bad thing in that movie. That sub sub scene with those that gang and who are you supposed to be? Uh you see, the police know who he is, so you fucking should know who he is. They've got a yeah. light that shines up in the sky for him. You know, yeah. fuck. That is such bad writing. I mean, it, it, he's it, again, if you're following how Batman should be, he doesn't really become Batman until after he's already spent time with the League of Shadows. That version of Batman would get his backside kicked by some of the worst members of the League of Shadows from the way that he acts in that movie. I mean, you wow. Your your mistake, Keith. You're expecting quality writing from J.J. Abrams' acolytes. Well, no, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. I'll tell you the reason why, and I'll tell you the reason why a lot of other people had the same idea as me. If you remember, why did that movie? Why was that movie written and done the way that it was? Well, that's because he had originally been hired to be the director of the Batman that was written by Ben Affleck. Okay? When Ben Affleck finally decided that he wasn't going to direct the movie, they hired the director of of the the recent Apes films, right? Well, then after a while, he decided he just wasn't going to make the movie. Rather than take the script, use that script, and hire someone else to be Batman, the entire script is pitched. The director leaves. He adds a year onto that entire production to rewrite the entire script. So he had a year by himself to work on that script. All, all I really know is if I was David Fincher, I'd be fucking pissed. It's like you copied my homework. You didn't even do it right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's it's, re- it's a really really the the writing is just awful for that film, and it should be better because again, I got nothing against any of the actors. Everybody cast in that fil- film is first rate. Though there is a sign, and this is how I know no one's ever actually read any Batman. It's a very simple thing. Anyone that ever goes, oh, Bruce Wayne, you should just use your wealth to solve all of Gotham's problems. 
hasn't fucking read any of the fucking comics because they've gone into that. Anytime he starts donating stuff, surprise, charities can be corrupt as all hell. Mm -hmm. You're, you've got a corrupt town, which means anybody that you hire for that charity is going to be from that town. You know, I mean... <sighs> yeah, th there was even even the, the White Knight comic the guy did. Uh, Sean, was it Sean Graham Murphy, I think his name yes. is? Went yes. into that. There was actually like this fund that was set up to deal with all the damage Batman does. And Bruce Wayne's at a party and he finds out that, oh, yeah, we just, you know, see where the activity is going on and we just, you know, buy up the property, heavily insure it. And then the Batman fund goes and then we make a shit ton of money. There's people that are profiting off of mm -hmm. everything that is wrong with Gotham. And that's yeah, why it doesn't change. Yeah, because Gotham is a thoroughly corrupt city, you know, at, at, at its best. With Batman operating there, Batman probably has cleaned up maybe maybe uh, twenty five percent. I mean, twenty five percent of the city is is the good portion left in Gotham when Batman first starts. So by the end of his career, it's safe to say that Batman was able to clean up maybe another twenty five percent. You know, uh, it, it's just. If you're going to do something, if you're going to make your own Batman, at least pay attention to who the character is and the reasons why things are the way they are before you put your own spin on it. And, yeah, and, and Chief Gordon, Amongst... Gordon's Chief Amongst, the exception, not the rule for most of the cops there. Most of the right. cops are even halfway decent, are like Bullock. He'll do what he has to survive, but he ain't on the straight and narrow either. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a city where everybody's had to do something to survive. And people have made compromises. You know, nobody's perfect, but that's not what Gotham is now. Metropolis is different. Metropolis is supposed to be the golden city. It's supposed to be the perfect place, the city of tomorrow. Gotham is is not so much a, you know, it's it's. It, if you're it, talking it's about because because Lex owns the town and he does he's not going to put up with any of that shit, and he has the connection to make sure none of that shit gets to his city. Because he, right. he runs Gotham. That's right. He runs Metropolis. Not and, Gotham. And whereas Gotham, it's a physical manifestation of the sickness of the city. You know, it's it's so sick that it's manifesting physically uh, in, in, in the look of the city, the feel of the city, and in the people there. That's, that's what Gotham is, you know? So, excuse me. It's, it's just... I don't know. It's JJ's people haven't proven to me that they are truly talented people. You know, I'm not saying that they're evil but people the or anything. Things that I've ever seen of JJ's that I liked was regarding Henry and Mission Impossible, the one film he worked. Yeah, on. Mission Impossible Three is the one he did, the first one. I liked it. Uh, yeah, he yeah. did a good job. He helped create the the avenue for. Uh, Tom to create his uh, Mission Impossible universe. Yes, yes, he made it better. He, he found an avenue for Tom to be able to hook everything together to make it as good as it should be. Although, for those of you that saw or were part of Script Doctor's show today with RMB, uh, I thought they made a compelling case as to the reason why the first one is a really, really good one. Uh, uh, By the is... way, do you know how J.J. Abrams got the job for uh, for uh, Mission Impossible? Yeah, Someone Tom gave Tom Alias on DVD, yes. and he went through it, and he loved it so much. He just, you know, on a whim got J.J. Yeah, and and it was I, a good... did, I did. Alias was okay. I just didn't get into it. Alias was a good show to, until you got into until they fully got into the mythology of the series when it was just a spy show. The first two to three seasons of Alias are fantastic, but once you start, once they started to become obsessed with the mythology of it, and 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 got into all of that stuff, the show took a turn, you know, and it's the same problem that ultimately Lost was uh, uh, inflicted with, you know, the character interactions, the mystery of it is the highlight, you know, the first three to four seasons 
of the show are amazing. Uh, for my money, with the exception of what had happened in the season before the final season, where they were able to explain even some of the, the weird stuff from the first two seasons, which I liked, you know, when you got the big uh, reveal or unveiling of, of some of the, the, the explanations for some of the weirdness that happened in the first two seasons. Outside of that, the show was just headed a particular direction, and none of those writers could save it because they were working against, again, as Gary had said earlier, if you treat it as a mystery, they should have had a, an, an understanding of where an they were going to end. And, and I believe they, they had an outcome, but the fans guessed it, and it screwed the show up. That happens, too. That happens way too much. If anything, I think creators need to stop browsing fucking Reddit. Because here's the thing. People, <laughs> there's a billion, you know, million, however many people are watching your series. Statistically, and more importantly, if you've done your job as a writer, there should be people that are able to guess what the outcome is because you're actually fucking setting it up correctly. If yeah. you, no one can guess what it is, You've actually failed as writer because there's no fucking logic to what you're doing. But they have this obsession with, as um, Hitchcock would put it, they have the obsession with the fucking bomb going off with no setup. Whereas a good creator, a good dramatist, tells you there's a fucking bomb under the t booth. Yeah. And people are talking about complete bullshit. And it's completely spell Because you know there's a fucking bomb that is going to go off and kill them if they don't find out about it. Mm -hmm. Everything is very important at that point. But if you take out that little bit of information and the bomb just goes off, you have complete boredom and shock and surprise for 10 seconds. Yeah, well, that that's that's all of Star Trek under Kurtzman. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm going to go to some starred comments real quick. Lord Thoth. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, let's see. Lord Thoth says, uh, Emergency of SWAT helped me decide to become a soldier, then law enforcement. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, I almost became a cop because of growing up on Adam 12. Um, let's see. An emergency spun off of Adam 12, I believe, with Jack Webb. It was realistic enough without being gross or, yeah, they're pretty realistic uh, about things on the show, as much as you could be on P with PG TV. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, Pop Culture Mindfield, I'd rather watch the old Black Hole movie than Star Trek 2009. I agree. I like that film. Uh, Bob. Yeah. Oh, Alias was good until season three. I just, I don't know. I never got interested in that show. I liked her. Jennifer was. Gardner. Yeah, she was something. But, oh, her with the red hair, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, and I heard that she and Ben Affleck are supposed to be making a return together in something with Deadpool, or I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, they're reprising their roles from 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 uh, uh, Daredevil. There's, that there's movie would have been good if it hadn't been for the teeter totter scene. Well, that movie would have been fantastic. And both if used, I was terrible they, if, they if they had used the director's cut of the movie. Yeah. Uh, pop culture, my feel most people who haven't seen many past movies would not realize that J.J. Abrams ripped off scenes from other movies. Oh, yeah, he does it all the time. Um, him and Quentin Tarantino, big thieves. Uh, Trek, they call it homage. <laughs> Trek, we knew about because he said so, Wars, is pretty much on film how deep his fandom was. I think I get what you're saying, yeah. Because uh, he wasn't a fan of Star Trek. He was a fan of Star Wars, but I, I question his fandom. I think his buddy that he grew up with uh, that was in the show Heroes, I think he's a bigger Star Wars fan. Star Trek 09 is the most expensive pitch reel in the history of cinema. Mm. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Tree Rock says, um, Batman has been changed so many times, usually when a different writer is assigned, Batman has changed. Yeah, that's true. It's like in comics, it's been that way. Yeah. The fans accept them. It all depends because every big writer that gets hired wants to put their spin on it. So it all depends on how good the writer is, if the writer's poor or no. Yeah, because you know, guys, you guys know how much I love Mike Barron and I love Chuck Dixon. But I don't, Dixon and I get, have argued over the fact that I call bullshit on Batman not killing. I said, you can't hit somebody in the torso 
or the head without knowing you're risking killing them every single time. There's no safe way to do that. And the, the outcome could be death. And so um, now I'll accept that he doesn't want to kill, but he has to be very comfortable with killing because he's got to hit people and use weapons that could potentially kill. Well, if you're gonna if you're gonna buy into the version of Batman that has become the dominant version, meaning the post. And by the way, Graham doesn't agree with me either. If if, ahead, if you're gonna going. buy into the post Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams Batman, okay, then yeah, he's 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 someone who has to have a certain comfort with that because statistically, as you said, Gary, you're gonna kill somebody. It's just going to happen. Yep. You know? One of my favorite little things that they did in the Arkham games, which I just thought was hilarious, because you can control the Batmobile, and there's people on the street, so naturally you can run into them. You know what they have to do? Anytime you run into a person in the Arkham Knight with the Batmobile, a little electricity field goes off, and they go flying. So in other words, they're being stunned and flung away from the Batmobile yeah. that I'm running into them at high speed with. I'm like, this is not... That's not how this shit works. Now, this this is true, Tree Rock Creations. But at the same time, fans are responsible for fanfic. And a lot of fanfic out there is garbage. By the way, um, speaking of that, Gary... I think fans have a better grasp on the characters. Yes. You know yes. what? I found out they've been training the AI on because they have to get their stuff from somewhere. So how are they doing these scenarios? I found out they've been stealing fan fiction. From sites like fanfic.net, and I think they've been scanning a shit ton of stuff. So all that chat GTP stuff, it's literally been trained off the hard work and passion of a bunch of fans. So if it, if it's asked right this particular scenario, it's been done. Yeah. Wow. And by the way, there's another one that you should know. Um, if you're interested in medical stuff, is lactated ringers, uh, D5W, and um, I'm sorry, it was, somebody commented on it. Where's it at? It was, I think, it was Lord Foth, wasn't it? No, Dadman. Was it Dadman? Dadman. Okay, yeah. It's on screen. Lactate. Yeah, I finally got my first IV of lactated ringers yesterday. Learned of what uh, that and D5W from emergency. Yep. And it is part of your precious fluids cabinet in an ambulance. Uh, in, as a medic, I'll just tell you this a little bit. Uh, when we were in Riyadh, um, it's, it's a dry state. <laughs> Fucking Riyadh. There's no booze. But you can find booze. And the way I found booze was I befriended MPs. And MPs would point me in the right direction to find booze. And I would get booze and then I'd water it down. Because you've not seen problems in a military unit until you take a bunch of guys that are alcoholics, women too, uh, that are suddenly cut off. And so I kept the booze, watered down booze, in my precious fluids cabinet in my <laughs> It would be, be stacked up behind. And our last uh, weekend in Riyadh before we got shipped back home, uh, it was temporary duty. Um, the last week we were there, um, weekend, I... Um, we drank it all. And um, the next morning, our lieutenant goes walking by and smells the back of my ambulance. It, says, it smells like a brewery. <laughs> Why does it smell like a brewery? I have no idea. I spilled some some of the liquids. Maybe they just fermented overnight. <laughs> you know, wow. the lactated ringers, D5W, man. You never know. Saline. They mix. You make explosives out of those. They can't. Um, if you've seen the real world episode of Hercules that involved Kurtzman and Orsi, uh, they apparently lived on the lot, uh, janitor's closet. I'm going to tell you, uh, personal, I was told firsthand about what Kurtzman was like. And, uh, Kurtzman was an idiot, uh, working on those shows and he failed upward because he would be the last one standing because People would get fired or quit, and the next thing you know, he's all that's left. And that's how he began his career, was failing upward. He was not one of the best writers on that show at all. He was not very good at all. Uh, 
I was told by our, you know, I don't want to say his name on here, but, uh, you know, he explained that, um, that everything that uh, Kurtzman would write had to be rewrote. Or that re makes total sense. And you know, Here, let me, let, me, let me give you my shock face. Oh, wait <laughs> what? You can't see it. <laughs> what? <laughs> See, the, the, the other sad part is I think we had stronger female characters back in the 90s than we do now, even though they're attempting to turn them into girl bosses. Because... We had stronger females in the 70s with Alien. Yeah. No, but like like Xena Warrior Princess, like Xena and Callisto, one of my favorite like rivalries period like of all fiction. Just that works so well. It had such a great dynamic. I mean, the motivation of the villain makes sense, and they have a good reason for it. You fucking murder, you tore, you burned her village down, you killed her entire family as a result. You're responsible for that. What are you going to do about it? She has a completely valid reason for wanting to destroy the lead character, because it's her past, Xena's past coming to bite her in the ass. And that's what they don't have. You cannot have a character like Xena in this day and age because Xena made a shit ton of mistakes. The entire series is about her making up for all the terrible shit she did before the series started. And that's, her... and that's, that's what really uh, made the uh, series Angel from Buffy also good. Because Angel was not a good person for, for and it's, generations. And it's a better show. I, I could not watch Buffy very much. It just really drove me crazy. But then I could sit down and watch Angel. And well, Angel was really Christian. Batman and Robin before there was, yeah, you know. Yeah. Though, it was, it was though there is Robin. one very important distinction between the two. Xena was in complete control of what she was doing when she was. Angel had the whole thing of his soul, soul was taken from him, so he's kind of responsible and kind of not. Xena, no, she knew every. She was completely okay with what she was doing when she did it. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely that. But I mean, again, you're talking, you know other writers and other properties that were handled way better than a lot of what Kurtzman uh, was able to, to, to actually handle, you know, oh, he, I, he, I, again, Kurtzman really is a modern day Fred Fry, Freiberger because he's, he's just not that really good, but he's a good person. If you need somebody to do some cheap work quick. Yep. As long as you don't care about the quality of what they're doing, yeah, he, he'll 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 get you out of a, a script real quick. You know, or, may not make any sense, but or or just her character dynamics. One of my favorite dramatic scenes in all of Xena was when Callisto has taken Xena's body, and she's you know I'm not going to give it up. Well, you know you can't guilt me because you're responsible for everything. So knocks her out. She goes in a little Tartarus thing. And all the people she's killed start going on there. But she's in Xena's body. And then my favorite thing is her mother actually shows up saying that I, I forgive you. I love you, but you can't keep doing this. And then she's like, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It was her. And Xena's in her body. So she's pointing at herself. This is so such simple, great character dynamics. I don't see them doing anymore. Yeah. No. Well, uh, yeah. It's it's difficult to watch a lot of this stuff, and it's difficult to watch Star Trek now because none of it is really that good. Again, I keep telling people it took me six months to make it through the pilot episode of Strange New Worlds because of the amount of dumb for that script for the pilot, and that was just the pilot. You know, it, it's just it's awful writing and it is oh God. it is Can it is imagine? an insult to the talent of every single person that works on that show that is not a writer or connected to the writer's room you know it, it's just dumb yeah could you imagine like if they actually had proper character oh, dramatic it'd be the, what it'd they be the best do? show on tv that it's show just... was set up to be the best to be the best show on television to be the greatest science fiction event on TV, and they can't even get it right. Because <laughs> I, I got one. I got one. Just off the top of my head, haven't thought about this much at all, just except for just now. Imagine they went to you know do a checkup on a planet, 
and suddenly, it, you know, they were listed as being a pre-warp civilization. And then suddenly they're so much more advanced. And it turns out one of the crew members had been assigned there and actually felt bad, actually had broken the Prime Directive to help them out. Yeah. Well, and then there's the whole thing of like, I have to help people. Yeah, but you broke our, the Prime Directive. Yeah, but the damage has already been done. But, you know, there could be like a fascistic day. Taylor, really. It's like, these are the consequences for what you did. But they were in shit to the first place. You could have a nice debate. It could have been something a character did for moral and noble reasons, but they didn't think about the consequences for. That's a and dynamic. That, and that's go ahead and insert a scene and an opportunity for Mr. Spock to again drop an F-bomb. Yeah. I'd be, yeah, they would be like, what the fuck? Did, did, did you, you guys, do? any of you see this latest episode? No, oh, God. I really I, don't. I, I've read the synopsis to it, and I'm like, this is the dumbest fucking thing I've ever heard of. Let, let me get this straight: that he's genetically altered to lose the Vulcan side of his body, but he wasn't brain damaged in any way, no memory <laughs> loss. But he f suddenly can't remember how to be Vulcan or act like himself. Again, my my criticism still stands. That is probably because one the of Vulcan the way isn't biology. It is absolutely philosophical. Yes. Yeah. It's it a is, philosophy. It has nothing to do with his DNA. It is one of the, that episode is one of the best examples of how racist Alex Kurtzman and those writers are. Yeah. I, just, got, I got a better one job. right off the top of my head. A better one right now, right here. Someone who has a vendetta against the Vulcans engineers a virus to rob them of their higher functions. Higher thoughts. Oh, that, that, that will destroy them. Capital thinking, my bad. Go on. <laughs> and so the Vulcans start to go, you know, more to their more primordial thing. And, you know, Spock starts to grade down to Spock gets infected with the virus. So now Spock has to start relying on the other crew members to help him suss out the logic because he's still smart. He's still, but it's degrading down. So yeah, it's a it's, race well, against time. Dumb Before stock he... is still smarter than a person. Yeah, dumb stock <laughs> is still smarter than a person. But it's like it's like it's the equivalent of like he can start a sentence and he's almost finished it, but like some of the words are starting to disappear. So it's like he's going through Alzheimer's almost. Yeah. So it's like the thing, and then people have to start filling in. And Spock needs all this help from everyone around him, all of his friends, to suss everything out and to save the day. And the whole thing about you know the the individual who's petty and vindictive wanted to destroy the group and the only thing that prevents that is the group coming together in cooperation today and that's part of the vulcan way because the vulcans are not built around vengeance or hatred even after the whole thing happens so they they would still welcome back it's like we you need to pay for what you've did but we're not going to kill you or anything we are going to educate you because you're obviously genius you've built this virus i think that is an important skill but you're using it inappropriately and that would be the end of the episodes. They would bring him in to rehabilitate him, to make him understand why he was logically wrong for doing it, even though he is a genius. That's moral. That's in the philosophy of Star Trek. And I just made this shit up, and it's already better than the fucking Kurtzman crap. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, well, you know, guys, we, Kurt, our friend is here. Kyle is here, Zach, and I need to play the video. I don't want to interrupt anybody, but I got to. Hey, fuck you, Kyle. There you go, buddy. <laughs> the, the 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 thing the, the the thing that really makes all of that with Strange New Worlds so bad with that particular episode that they did with Spock is that they again they had, they took something that had been done better in a previous version of Star Trek, and by better and 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 a previous version I mean Star Trek: The Next Generation I think it was season two did an episode about um, a Klingon ritual that it was time for Worf to have. And since he wasn't amongst his own kind, uh, they had to choose people to help him with this ritual. Now, the way they handled it in the next generation is they actually researched everything so that they could properly help Worf. Instead of a bunch of people sitting around going, you... Here's how you act like a Klingon. You got to get up and have oh my bad breath. It's so and insulting <laughs> hearing how um, the crew are trying to tell Spock how to act like Spock. Oh, jeez. I'm like, are you serious? Oh, uh, my God. This show sounded terrible. 
Um, I, I already have a better one off the top of my head. You know, if you want to do the whole mature thing, all I'm saying is Spock starts to go through a mock time, and then suddenly certain female crew members around the ship start to be very happy. That's all hmm. I'm saying. I see that we have a dollar forty nine super sticker of a rose for Anima. Thank you, and, Sims. And Anima a beach. appreciates it. There I know. Are, yeah, there there are two super stickers from Six. Wow, the one from yes, the one for forty nine and one for me for beach. made of poop. I, I love you, Six. Oh, I love so you there so are much. three st super stickers now. <laughs> what was the so, the other one? The first one is a peach. The second one is the rose for anima, oh. and the, and the third one is your poop. It's poop for me. It's poop Six. for you. I love you, like female Star Trek fans love Kirk and Spock slash fiction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now I'm going to share something with you here. Um, this is a, a Fred Freeberger show. And uh, we'll probably get claimed for it. I'll remove it later. But this is uh, from a little show called Korg, 7,000 years BC. 70. Or 70,000, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hanna-Barbera. Live Korg action. stares from the bird in his pouch to the bird in the sky. Burgess Meredith. And fear and wonder fill his heart. Primitive man is superstitious and attributes to the spirits those things he cannot easily understand. <laughs> the injured and exhausted Bach loses consciousness as they near the cave. Now, we all know that didn't happen. If, if, you, if you couldn't pull your weight, they just left you there. Yeah. Oh. Here, let me lay this out on the hard floor. <laughs> if certain things are to believe, they were actually pretty advanced. And then, you know, we have a complete cataclysm to destroy all technology. But this is they... just such a weird show. Do you remember this show, Keith? I do. Back only one bird. He sleeps. They speak perfect English. Yep. <laughs> I mean, that's Shakespeare, really. Korg from coming to me. Korg killed it. Can you believe this show only made one season? I would have never guessed. This is... Fred Freiberger, Freiberger at his best, right there. <laughs> wow! But Fred Wait, was well. trying. Fred was trying. He really was. All right. For um, those super stickers, I want to play some videos. Uh, first, I will play this one. This is um, uh, six on a date with her boyfriend. There's a camera on my bag. Hey. <laughs> 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 Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. <laughs> and finally, uh, because we all feel this way, I love it when a plan comes together. There we go. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> <laughs> the Alex Kurtzman version of A Team would be something to see. Oh, Not. God, please don't. He, he you already... know that face would be gay. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be after boy tail all the time. Wouldn't his name really be Closet then at that point? Closet. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> the nickname uh, hand, hand Job. <laughs> gosh. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, I, I just saw uh, Wolverine 66 had a great comment over on our show yesterday said those enterprise ships look amazing. I'm sure that Robert Meyer Burnett and Trek yards would be salivating over those images as well. Heck and yeah. the same clearly for Keith. <laughs> Heck yeah. I, but uh, again, $15,000, $15,000. 
do they actually fly? Can can they go warp? Do they have working weapons? Fifteen thousand dollars. Will it make my life better? <laughs> Will it at least get me laid? You know? <laughs> all, all, all I know is, and and this is the definitive proof of it. You can have all the money in the world, but if you don't have the talent for writing, that money just goes to waste. Because original Star Trek technically is a dinosaur compared to what they can do now. But well, as far as technology, the whole, yes. The core of what it is is light years ahead of the crap we have now. Yeah, because of the talent of the individuals involved with Star Trek. I mean, that, that again, I, I often tell people, if you were to have a list of all of the writers who wrote for Star Trek, look at how many of them were published authors, were considered to be some of the best writers, writers of their period. That's right. Of their period of science fiction as a genre. And right. and the awards and the accolades heaped upon them outside of Star Trek for a lot of the work that they were known for. Also, if Harlan Ellison had worked on this one in comparison with the original, he would have probably beaten the shit out of Alex Kurtzman. He would have beaten the, out of the entire writer's room. He would have had a field day. With Get that. out of here, kicking him in the ass. <laughs> it's like, you're canceled. Oh, well, that just means uh, since I don't work here anymore, that means I can use this baseball bat now. <laughs> he, he'd send them dead animals. He'd punch uh, Kurtzman in the uh, uh, clavicle or some shit like that. In an effort to, to be nicer to people, I am going to put a small pillow over this bat that I brought that way, it'll <laughs> muffle some of the sounds. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm going to put a, I'm going to put a thick blanket between you and these uh, sock full of soap bars. And I hit you with them. That way it doesn't leave any bruises. <laughs> That's not thoughtful at all. <laughs> oh, yeah. still get caught. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Kurtzman's that one kid uh, from summer camp that nobody liked in the cabin. And uh, <laughs> even the nerds picked on him. Yeah, even the nerds picked on him. Just, just a reminder when they did the game of I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, and they need the evil voice for Allied Master Computer, I am. They just went with Harlan still. Because <laughs> no one can have more malice than him and his voice. <sighs> I miss Harlan so much. I know the dude could be an he was asshole. Such a dick! But, oh my god, he could be. Yes, um, but that that didn't mean he wasn't right. Uh. <laughs> I mean, I will go back to the one thing that always pissed me off that he did is he tried to kill McCoy, and uh, yes. it's like, uh, no, you don't get to uh, fuck with the uh, Holy Trinity of Star Trek. Yes, yes, you cannot kill Bones. You cannot kill. Uh, um, Kirk, Kirk or Spock, you know, and he he demanded they kill McCoy. I'm like, fuck off, dude. You know, you're a great writer, but fuck off. I no. just would I would have looked at him and said, Harley, you're a great water writer, but you have to understand, it's good to want things. It is good to want happen. It's good to want things and not always get them. And <laughs> the fact is, is, I read the version. You know, he forgets version. his place. That this isn't his creation. That's right. That's what so, everybody nowadays in Hollywood needs to understand. If you did not create this, it technically really isn't yours. You know, yep. you're just borrowing until the next person is allowed to have said mm -hmm. chance at, at that IP. Uh, everybody needs to understand that, whether you're talking film, TV, or even comics. And that is the one lesson that has been forgotten. Because everybody treats it as if, oh, well, I can do whatever I want with this character. You know, Greta Gerwig. It's like, hey, why would why would anyone want a Barbie after this current movie? What is this? Oh. Uh, Pop culture minefield. Does the Doctor character in Kurtzman Star Trek use a phaser set on kill to stop intruders? Gary knows. The, I don't know the answer to that. I have no clue. Um, I don't like Kurtzman Trek, so I don't watch much of it. Uh, would violate his oath. I mean, was... his did he? Well, I know that that a Doctor shouldn't. That he should not put it on kill unless he knows it's absolutely necessary to protect himself or others. That his intent would to do no harm. 
Mm-hmm. But well, uh, the well, fact the is, difference. doctors kill too on purpose in combat. That that's that's the difference between what was written for a character like McCoy. McCoy would struggle with that, but he also knew that in times that were extremely rare but very important, he knew that when it really came down to it, that Kirk, Spock, and the rest of the crew did not make those decisions likely. You know, lightly. He 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 would argue sometimes, but he knew it deep down. You know, a lot of these current Kurtzman characters, doctors, are not real people. They're, 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 all of this stuff is written for children. Or at least. Just came up with another one. Just came with another one. A uh, terrorist has a bomb on a plant. He was playing the Denny, but he gets hurt in the middle of it. And so the doctor is operating him and saving his life. But he knows. That as soon as he gets better, he's going to set off that bomb. Right. So he's trying, spends the episodes spending the time trying to convince him. Also, other people try to convince the doctor, just let him die. Because then he can't do that. Like, if you know someone's going to do something terrible, should you still save their life? Well, uh, let me at least push back a little bit on your idea. Kurt, okay. if, this, if this had been, you know, real Star Trek, Kirk would never really do that. He would present his argument to Bones. And the one thing that, you know, you also have to understand about the power of the physician is that uh, every doctor, every chief medical officer on board of every starship has the power to actually take uh, uh, command away from the captain. That's a little something that, uh, you know, Kirsten probably didn't understand because he didn't read all the he, – he's never watched all the episodes. But well, yeah, yeah. Bones the could do it. would be the person whose planet has the bomb on it. Yeah. Maybe the but, third but, party. Hey, guys, but, we got Bones, another super sticker i got to cut in here. E. Clay Thomason with $1.49. Do we know what that sticker is? Yeah, it's a uh, hot dog. Hot dog. Oh, wow. The wiener. Oh, jeez. Uh, or, as we call them, a Kurtzman. Uh, oh, so you, E. Clay Thompson, you get this. You get this classic video for thank you, Ma. I'm doing a show. I'd buy that for a dollar. I'd buy that for a dollar. Yeah. Uh, should I play that one too? I'll play that one too for everybody. This is a, a throw out to all you guys at the Super Stickers deck. Where is it? It should be on here. Where the fuck is it? I'm not seeing it. Yeah. I'll just that for a just those types of things. I like actual like moral dilemmas. Because it especially helps you figure out what your actual morality is. Mm-hmm. And that's what Star Trek used to do and used to do very well. And, and they, it was they something like want to copy measure of a man. It pisses it, me it, off. It's something that, again, you could watch with the entire family. And it was important to watch that. You know, uh, nobody heard me that up. I was getting ready to do a video. You guys oh. just didn't hear me at all. I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. We're excited, man. We're sorry. Uh, video's gone. So I'm going to play this one from Robocop. <laughs> Thank you for your cooperation. It, 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 the thing about Star Trek is that it could be any episode could be viewed and enjoyed by the entire family. And it was meant to actually spark discussions. If kids had a question about what they just saw, it's important to have your parents there to be able to answer questions. Okay. Nowadays, Kurtzman, okay. he doesn't make okay. stuff for the logical side of your brain. Everything is about the emotion of the scene. It's about playing on your or with your emotions. And it's, a, it's about the emotional yeah. truth rather than about anything outside of, of, of just uh, appealing to uh, uh, logic. Speaking of appealing to, uh, we got a banana sticker from Parrot Head for $1.49. Oh, I don't know what is going on with the, the Sally symbols today. Oh. Remember, Sally, when I promised to kill you last? That's what made you... You did! I lied. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> or here's another one. Here's another one to it. Related to something that's going on now. There's currently a faction, like, planet that's independent, like, you know, like, around the neutral zone, like, some, you know, weird technicality. That is, the clans are going against. Well, the Federation's supplying them with weapons. Is it right to do that? 
because in a way they are doing war by proxy against the Klingons. Well, I mean, they, they've already done that in an episode of Star Trek before, you know. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I imagine they have. Uh, that's the whole point with it, is that doing analogs of things that are actually going on, but being clever about it. Yes, you can actually yes. debate the issue. I mean, it, it, if you really want to impress these strange new worlds, why don't you go back and find out exactly what the Mogatu is? Well, let's, let's go to this, because uh, he keeps bringing up the doctor here. And I'm going to point something in Strange New Worlds. Um, the character, I forgot his name, the doctor in the original Star Trek. Um, Boyce. Boyce. Dr. Boyce was Pike's best friend. And yeah. it, it was meant to be that way. He was going to be Pike's best friend on the show. If Pike had been the captain of the series, but because the, the pilot failed and had to shoot a new one, and he, you know, he wasn't available, so they got Kirk. But uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. It's Dr. Piper. I'm sorry, Dr. Piper. Dr. Piper. Boyce was the doctor that, that they had temporarily had with right. Kirk for yep. one episode. One episode. And then another classic Western actor. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it was, you know, this character was meant to be his best friend, his his confidant, his personal confidant. And uh, and what do they do in Strange New Worlds? They create a whole new doctor. And it's for a checkbox. And don't get me wrong, guy's a good actor. I do like. Well, him. that's not a but whole new doctor. That's actually a doctor that served on the Enterprise. He was just never the chief medical officer. He served under uh, McCoy because they brought him in. Well, the so thing is, he, though, they're leaving out. Piper yes. Yes. And, um, on purpose. And I think that's a mistake because then they're trying to turn turn Pike and Spock into Kirk and Spock, and yep. that's not the dynamic. Yep. Uh, he was his third officer, or was he? Yeah, third officer. He was third mm -hmm. officer of the deck. Uh, number one. At, no, he was second officer. Second officer of the deck. And then, uh, uh, what's her name? Was uh, number one. Yeah, number one. So, just, it's really weird. Is yeah, it's they, just, uh, I don't know what's going on here, Animal, with all the phallic symbols. It's a lot of phallic symbols. Wow. All I know is stickers today. <laughs> At the rate they're going, Spock seems to go through captains like Amber Heard goes through men. <laughs> oh, Amber Heard with a, another complete script for Alex Kirchner <laughs> on the <Yep>. nurse bed. <laughs> so we're reaching reverie. me into this, and, and I want to um, pop in and uh, talk about a couple of things. Season one of Strange New Worlds, I watched the entire season. Uh, had two moments that I liked. Uh, there were tiny little moments in each episode that was enjoyable, but a lot of it was just stupid. And I was just like, God, it will just not get better. And then they had two episodes that I really liked. And this was uh, one of them right here. Uh, right? Boom, baby, this one. And I liked this story. I liked it. was a good Pike episode. Oh, wait. I'm having trouble loading. God, I hope this doesn't crash on me. Fuck. Fuck StreamYards, man. <laughs> and I know this is StreamYards causing this problem. Because I have a strong enough internet right now that it shouldn't be doing this. And I'm not using anything else on my computer. There it is. Thank you. Lift us up where, uh, lift us where suffering cannot reach. Where the little boy has to sit down into a chair and become a source of energy for this culture and Pike tries to stop it from happening. And uh, I liked that episode. It was damn good acting, good drama, uh, good writing. I'm like, how did this sh happen? And I thought, is Star Trek trying to write the ship here with this? And it made me very happy, this, this episode. Uh, rest I wasn't happy with, but this episode was fun. Uh, this one was called the Elysian, Elysian Kingdom. And it was weird, but I did enjoy it. I had some chuckles watching it. It was it was really good. The thing I thought was funny was it turned Captain Pike into a dandy. And I went, of course, the most masculine guy on the show has to be turned into a dandy. You know, can't have that toxic masculinity. And wow. It. But uh, it was a good episode. And uh, again, the writing was good. The only thing I felt was dumb is this is clearly a character borrowed straight from 
a uh, queue. Mm-hmm. Why not make it a queue? Like an infant queue, a child queue? I don't know. It just felt really stupid that they did that. But I still enjoyed the episode. Past that, season one, crap. For the most part, crap. <laughs> they, they wanted to show how strong uh, Rebecca Romaine is as number one and goes up against, uh, what's her name, the con character. And they, they get into a fight and it's like, you know, do you not know how to show power, physical power? That, you know, to show physical strength, you have to pit something against something else that you know is strong, that you know is strong. And you get a tiny girl fighting a bigger woman, and it's just a girl fight. That's all it was. It doesn't convey what they're trying to do, which is make them all strong. It, it failed. And uh, and that's the problem with, with Kurtzman Trek and is they don't know how to do things. Yeah. No, so if you, it's not, they're trying. They think they're reinventing the wheel, and this no. shit was done before. All you got to do is follow. In the no, if you if you want a strong woman, the White Widow in the Mission Impossible, she has a shit ton of strength. She doesn't have to do much of anything because she has all the fucking cards mm-hmm. when they're at that club. Well, classic Trek had a cue too. It's called Trelane. And Trelane mm-hmm. eventually became part of canon that he is was part of the Q continuum, that he was an it, infant. It, it would just be so much easier to just say, hey, you know what? This is just a different version of the reality that we knew and that they are completely free to go and do whatever they want with these characters, meaning that Spock and Kirk don't necessarily have to serve on the same ship. In this version of their well, they reality. should just leave the main characters out completely and let new characters come in. But no, they keep they're trying to go back and rewrite these characters in an annoying yeah, way. Was, they they have already stated that before that the the real purpose of what Kurtzman Trek is attempting to do is to basically take a lot of the stuff that's already been done by other shows and bring it up to where quote unquote bring that up to to the standards that they have now. Standard. It, fucking standard. It's absurd. It's absurd because it they is. keep talking about improving and fixing things. Yes. But yes. they're relying on all that stuff from the past that they claim isn't any good. Yeah. It's a That's complete it. contradiction. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's, it's, it's bad. It's bad, is what it is. Okay. And, uh, we got to wrap up. That's yes. the end of the show. So, um, look, Fred Freiberger was Alex Kurtzman. 0.1 and um <laughs> he he was a fuck up and he screwed up two shows great shows um stepped in and i'm certain he had no idea how bad he was i'm certain of it i'm certain that you know we're kind of shitting on him a little bit but i'm certain he went with the best of intentions and created crap uh he took a, a cerebral science fiction series space 1999 and turned it into a monster of the week that even had your classic Saturday morning intro. You know what I'm talking about? They changed yeah. the intro of Space 1999 in the second season to include her transforming the, the metamorph or mesomorph, whatever the fuck she was. And um, God, what a... F- she was hot, but just such a dumb character transforming into other creatures. Yeah. It was so Saturday morning. And they, they, t- they turned Koenig who is a thoughtful character, mm-hmm. always being thoughtful. Let's action not first. And even in the opening intro, turn him into a guy that jumps up and fires his laser. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God, what the fuck? Barbara Bain walks with fast intent going by the camera because the doctor really does is unless she's doing doctor stuff, what is she going to do? Walk, mostly. To walk. This well, interact so with, with Koenig and, and to be rescued by him because, you know, she's the... She's but, the emotional balance that he needs. Yeah, so. God, the second season was rough. I still enjoy watching it because I just love Space 1999. But man, I'm watching it now. Go, God, that's dumb. Oh my God, that's dumb. <laughs> but you know what? That is no. that is Fred Freiberger, and God love him. You know, God rest his soul. Um, fuck you, Fred Freiberger. Um, I hope you rot in hell. No, I don't. But no, uh, I do think 
he's down in hell looking at him <laughs> and, up and screaming. <laughs> I think that's you what's know, going got him on. In hell. It was the second show, screwing up the second show. It was the first one, he would got limbo, but no, he had to screw up Space 1999 and he had to go to hell for that. Um, I get you. We are wrapping up. Penny, I want to thank you. Anima Confusa, of course, love of my life. Slasher Fred, Bush McFadden is here. Uh, Lord Thoth, all hell, Lord Thoth. Peter Rickman fan site, uh, Vickman's Girl, Andy Morrow, Parrothead, Dead Man Walking, Salty Nerd Podcast, Jeff PDX1. Uh, e. Clay Thomason, Mighty Orbots was here. I didn't even see any comments from him. Tree Rock Creations, uh, Six was here. Lovely Six, wonderful Six. Zach's our good friend. Real Wade Nation Gaming Clips. And of course, FKHC2005, a.k.a. Tim, was here. I want to thank everybody. Uh, thanks for being here, Shinatsky. Martin, thanks for being the right side of my brain. Keith, thanks for being my partner in crime. And Mike, I don't know what happened to you, man. Comic Relief Crusader, he was here and he left. But have a great Saturday, guys. Hope everybody um, enjoys this weekend because it's going to be a doozy. Those sons of bitches. Ma, I'm doing a show. The Dumpers, the Dead Man Walking Next. Kirkman is considered...